listening to the Paul McGuire Report, broadcasting from Los Angeles, California. And I want to welcome you to today's edition, wherever you're listening, in the USA, anywhere in the USA. If you're in the EU or a related nation, any continent you may be on, Australia, New Zealand, South America, and so on. Welcome to today's program. Why? Because this is a program where truth is elevated to its proper position. This is a program where knowledge gives you power. You see, if you have real knowledge, which is the knowledge of things that matter, that always equates to power. Whenever in history, Whenever in history a elite wanted to enslave its population, one of the first things they would do to enslave their population was to deprive the people, the common people, of knowledge. Knowledge of history, especially, because the elite feared, and, and when I say elite, I'm talking about the super wealthy elite. That, that still exists today. But the elite understood that if the common man or woman understood history, then that knowledge of history would give them power. And that knowledge of history would give them the ability not to make the same mistakes that their ancestors made. Because after all, how was it that the common people became slaves in the first place? They became slaves because they didn't have knowledge, especially the knowledge of history. You know, you heard that expression. Those that don't learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. And isn't it a tragedy in, in the Western nations and other nations, especially in America, isn't it a tragedy that the great masses of people have been deliberately dumbed down? In fact, as Sir Aldous Huxley would say, that an elite, a scientific elite, strategically dumb down the people. Why? Because they wanted to enslave the people. How do you enslave the people? Well, you bring them into captivity. And when you're in captivity, then you're on the fast track to slavery. But you see, if you don't know anything about history, you can't recognize the warning signs all around you. So, for example, in Great Britain, or China, or the USA, or any, any number of nations, the people, the working class, the middle class, and even, to, to a large degree, <clears throat> the upper classes. By upper classes, I'm not talking about that, that fractional, tiny 1% at, at the top. I'm talking about upper class in terms of they have uh, a relative amount of prosperity and money, but they don't know anything about anything. Because then they would realize that on the fast track to slavery, they are going to go into uh, slavery just as quickly, maybe a few minutes later, maybe at the end of the line, maybe in the middle of the line, but they're on their way to slavery, too. So why am I talking about this, for crying out loud? First of all, I'm talking about it because it seems that there are very few people willing to talk about it. Second of all, as a Christian, I take the Bible or the Word of God seriously especially the, the commandments that God prioritizes, that Jesus Christ made a priority of. So, for example, you know, you can major 
on the minors <clears throat> in the Bible. You can get all upset and all focused in on some obscure, and it may have minor importance, but you're but you're hyper focused on some obscure uh, passage, and you're missing the big picture. And what is the big picture? Well, first of all, you've got to understand who God is. Who is God? God is love. And then what, what, what does God want from us? That's you, that's me. Well, God tells us he wants us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And in, in the body of Christ, or, or the church, or, or among Christians, Jesus Christ repeated this constantly. In 1 John, it says it over and over again. If you love one another, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So, so the most powerful force in winning souls, <clears throat> the most powerful force in evangelism, occurs when people who call themselves Christians love one another with the pure agape spiritual love of Jesus Christ. When we love one another, it's Christ's love church. So if I love my neighbor as myself, then am I going to stand or sit idly by and watch my neighbor? That's the person next to you. It doesn't necessarily have to be your exact geographic neighbor. It's your neighbor. It's, it's the person, the people in your family, the people that you know, the people that you interact with. All of those people become your neighbor. The people in the church or fellowship or Bible study you go to. <clears throat> now, if I don't love my neighbor as myself, then I could be content to sit on my posterior and say nothing and never bring up the truth and never remind them that, that if things continue to go in the direction that they're going, according to a study of the Bible, according to a study of, of accurate history, we are on the fast track to some form of slavery, captivity. So if I really loved my neighbor as myself, I couldn't sit idly by and say nothing. I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're all ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I'm also a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I preside over Paradise Mountain Church. <clears throat> and can I stand in the pulpit and I can I sit before the microphone that you're listening to talk to you? Can I get on video and television, which you may uh, have seen me on, and I do all those things and more. Social media platforms, etc. Can I do all those things and with a clean conscience remain silent, say nothing? Now there are plenty of ministers who are not all. But there, there are many notable exceptions, but the majority of ministers are content to say nothing. And not only that, it's, it's not even evident if they could say something that they have, and I don't mean this to be insulting, but do they have the mental faculties to say something to begin with? In other words, one would have to have some kind of knowledge of history in order to say something to people that you claim you love in order to warn them of their potential demise or their slavery or captivity. So, so there's an assumption being made 
And that is, the assumption is, are there a sufficient number of clergy or ministers or pastors who have the ability to say something? Because one way or the other, and it wouldn't most likely have been in the educational system, which is designed to indoctrinate you and dumb you down, one would have to assume that they had enough knowledge of history and knowledge through through some kind of form of self-education, some kind of desire, some kind of inner desire to educate oneself, to, to acquire knowledge of history, knowledge of the way things work. Because if you have acquired that kind of knowledge, especially the knowledge of history, I'm telling you right now, and most of you know what I'm talking about, it's, you, you know that it's true. I'm telling you right now, it's flat out next to impossible not to know the big question, which everyone seems to be asking, which is, what happens next? What happens next? Now, um, that is an important question. But you see, if you're stuck in the zone or the space or the place feel like I'm reading Dr. Seuss, but after all, Dr. Seuss is in the process of being censored. One would think that thinking people and Christians could do the math, don't you think? That if Dr. Seuss is being censored, isn't it obvious that the Bible is going to be censored also? If a culture is going to censor uh, books that, that are not threatening whatsoever, they're certainly going to censor the Word of God or the Bible. That's coming up. You realize that. Most of you realize that, or you wouldn't listen to the program. The philosopher said, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. So, the question that needs to be asked, and we're going to get into this in a little bit on, on today's program of the Paul McGuire Report. The question that should be asked is not only like what happens next, <clears throat> although if you had a minimal knowledge of history, you would know 100% what's going to happen next why I wrote my book, to teach people how to think for themselves so they could answer the question for themselves, what happens next? That's why I wrote The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, because it explains history in a fast-moving, easy-to-understand, and attention-grabbing way. And if you even glance at the book, you'll know what happens next. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes for crying out loud. Why? Because history repeats itself. That's the whole thing about the knowledge of history. It inevitably repeats itself. It goes through cycles. Now, knowledge is important. You can, you can read a secular his, historian who's accurate in his or her knowledge, and you can learn the lessons of history. If you study the Bible within the framework of rightly dividing the Word of God, that means you interpret it properly, you see that when God deals with his people, beginning with Adam and Eve, then going to the children of Israel, and going to the, the Church of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> you see that God deals with his people in cycles. And so his people, when they're serving the Lord, when they're worshiping the Lord, when they're obeying his commandments, when they're studying his commandments, they come under a blessing. They come under protection. They, they're prospered by the Lord. They're blessed by the Lord. But inevitably, what history shows us inside the Bible, and the Bible is an accurate historical book, probably the most accurate historical book, what we see in the Bible, though, is a disturbing pattern. 
when the children of Israel began to prosper, when God began to bless them, um, and they prospered, they, they began to turn from the true God. They began to worship the idols and the pagan gods of the pagan nations around them. They began to stop reading the Bible, the commandments of God, and they began doing what was right in their own eyes. Thus, these two primary sins, which are reiterated constantly throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, where God's people reject God, just like Adam and Eve did, and they follow false gods, and they don't obey the commandments of God, what happens inevitably, and on a cyclical basis, and God gives us the history, they go into captivity, which means they go into slavery, then they're conquered, and then they're made slaves, and then they serve some foreign king or emperor or whatever as slaves. I mean, for crying out loud, if you don't read the Bible, watch the movie The Ten Commandments with Carlton Heston. No, it's not an accurate portrayal of the Bible, so don't email me. But even though it's not totally accurate, it contains enough of the truth. In fact, I think it contains more truth than most evangelical sermons. But the Bible shows us that over and over again, God's people, after God blesses them, after God delivers them, after God rescues them, after God defeats their enemies, over and over again, they backslide, they worship idols, they break the commandments of God. And you know why they were in Egypt serving Pharaoh as slaves for 400 years. Because they rebelled against God and began worshiping the gods of Egypt. You know why in in the book of Daniel, read the book of Daniel, rightly divide the word of God. God's people, again, they disobeyed God, they worshiped idols, they broke his commandments. And guess what? They, They violated God's law of the Sabbath, which was a big deal in the Jewish religion. So what happened? What happened to them? They were conquered by the Babylonians and brought into slavery. And then God raises up a prophet named Daniel supernaturally, and now remember this, they're in captivity in Babylon. They're, 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 they're slaves. But the turning point in the spiritual battle, which allowed God to deliver them and allowed God to uh, bring them into freedom, the turning point for that was the the kind of spiritual warfare and genuine repentance before the Lord that Daniel engaged in. See, repenting before the Lord and faking it doesn't produce results. Maybe that's why Your prayers didn't get answered. I'm not trying to lay lay a legalistic guilt trip on you. It's just that if you're repenting and you're repenting and you're repenting, or God's people are gathering together in a nation and they're repenting, and there doesn't seem to be a response from God, you know, if you had just a couple of lights on in the home, like your brain, you could see where you were going. So if you're repenting and repenting, and it doesn't seem like God is answering your prayers, it's one of two things. Either God is a liar, the entire biblical story 
is a fairy tale. And God couldn't answer your prayers if he wanted to, because he doesn't exist. You, you got to come to terms with reality, man. Your, ch- your children are watching you. The secular world is watching. God's watching. So, either God doesn't exist and he can't answer your prayers, or your repentance was not acceptable to him. It was not authentic and genuine. So you've got to make a choice. Now, if God isn't answering your prayers and you keep going into slavery as a nation, do you think America right now is on its way to going into slavery as a nation? Do you think the people in America, of all classes, racial groups and ethnic groups, do you think that they're going into captivity or slavery in one form or another? There's many ways to analyze that. I deal with that in my book, which you should read. And you say, well, why are you always pushing your books? Because I've spent 40 years researching the material in the books. And I know for a fact that if you would read the books, there's so much of the Word of God in them and so much explanation where I apply the Word of God to history and current events, etc., that if you actually read the book, Knowledge is Power, you could be set free. You don't have to read the book. You could read the Bible. But you still have to come to the place where you're able to view reality all around us from a biblical worldview, and that's why my books are helpful to people. I didn't write them to poor people theologically. I wrote them for ordinary people like you and me. So I want to read you something. I want to read you something. Because this is the turning point. Daniel shows us by example. The Word of God teaches us how you and I can release God. You say, well, wow. why do I have to release God? Because God operates according to his laws. If you're going to violate God's laws and principles, there isn't going to be any juice. I'm talking about electricity. There's, no, there's not going to be any power to change any situation because you've, you've blocked the power of God by disobeying the word of God. Okay, I'm going to read you this. And while I go to the correct chapter of the book of Daniel, I want you to think about what I'm saying. And I thought about what I'm saying. I think about what I I say all the time. It tortures me. I stay up in the middle of the night wrestling with these things. I know that I'm a fallen man, just like you are, a fallen man and a fallen woman, saved by grace, unmerited favor. And I constantly ask God with my head on the pillow. You say, well, why do you pray with your head on the pillow? Because that's where I like to pray. Well, aren't you afraid you're going to fall asleep? Sooner or later, I'm going to fall asleep anyway. But it's a comfortable place to pray because I have a lot on my mind. So I pray on my pillow and I cry out to God. And one of the things I pray constantly is this. Lord. Put your knowledge, put your spirit in me. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your knowledge so that when I talk to your people on the radio program or TV or in the books or articles or at Paradise Mountain Church, wherever I communicate, Lord, I'm asking you this, that it just wouldn't be me talking, that your power, that your grace, that your mercy, that your truth, that your knowledge, that your wisdom would flow through me into the lives of your people and transform them. And, and Lord, spare them, spare me, the captivity that's coming, God. I pray that all the time. Okay, so visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Why? 
because you need to copy and paste all the links to all the social media platforms, the video platforms, the audio platforms, and everything else. We have all kinds of platforms for you. Not because we don't have anything better to do, because we do. And even though some of the platforms are free, it requires a considerable investment of monies to establish the platform so they work. What's the purpose of the platform? Really simple. When you read history and you see what happened in history before, and then you take a good look at what's happening uh, in contemporary history that has come alive right before our eyes, it does. you don't have to be Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison, or a rocket scientist to figure out that we could wake up one morning or in the middle of the night, they could take down all the technologies that we use to communicate to you and to people all around the world. Now, I'm not God. I need God's mercy. But God told me in his word, told you too, that I'm supposed to use my mind. Otherwise, he wouldn't have given me the mind of Christ in the first place. Notice that God gives us the mind of Christ. Notice it does not say in substitutionary language, God gives us the mind of an idiot. No, we weren't given the mind of idiots. We're given given the mind of Christ. And therefore, we should have a robust, amplified, powerful mind, consciousness, brain, perception. And if we learn from history, we know that what's happening now has happened before. And I can guarantee you, it's just a matter of time. I'm telling you right now, you better wake up. It's not a game. If they're going after Dr. Seuss for crying out loud, they're coming for the Bible or anybody who communicates the Bible or biblical truth. So we're proactive. If we're taken down on a bunch of sites, we already have pre existing platforms and sites for you to go to so we can stay connected so we can continue to communicate to you the truth and win souls for Christ. But in order for that proactive measure to work, you have to do your part. You have to make sure you have properly copied the links. Now, most of you know what I mean by that. Just copying the words of the link won't do you any good. Believe me, I've tried it. It'll take you nowhere. You have to have the link, and if you don't know how to do that, just copy and paste the, 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 the block uh, on paulmcguire.us, the artwork and stuff of all the uh, icons and symbols of all the uh, social media, etc. And keep it and test it. Press any one of those things, and it's going to take you directly to alternative sites that we're on. So you want to be proactive. But going through all that expense and effort is useless if you don't write it down or copy and paste it so you can go to it. Okay? I'm not saying this to be harsh. I'm saying this to get your attention. Because I know what's happening. Not because, as the Beatles song goes, Mother Mary came to me speaking words of wisdom. Let it be, let it be. You may like that song, but it's completely the antithesis of the Bible. First of all, we're not supposed to be talking to Mother Mary coming to us. We're supposed to be talking to Jesus and reading the Word of God. And second of all, you don't take the Word of God out of context. It's true. The Bible says, Be still and know that I am God. But you have to read all the other Bible verses that that shed light to the truth. Be still and know that I am God. But that's a huge difference than singing 
Mother Mary came to me or comes to me speaking words of wisdom, let it be, let it be. That's Eastern mystical thought. That's Buddhist thought. That's a cult thought. That's, that's the Buddhist principle of detachment, that you just let go of everything, and you go with the flow. That's Eastern mysticism. And if you think about it and use your God-given brain, which is very powerful, you know, oftentimes when I'm speaking, I'll speak. I'll be speaking in Bible prophecy, analyzing current events. But many times the Lord will arrest my attention while I'm speaking. And he'll tell me, in his still small voice, Paul, I want you to insert in, in your teaching right now the message that I've regularly given you that goes something like this. And I tell, I was speaking at a notable Christian college, and I was telling the students, as the Lord told me to, that, that no one in this room, God didn't create anybody in this room to be stupid, that God has given you credible intelligence and you are far smarter than you may think you are. And as I began ministering to the people under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I knew that I struck the pay dirt or gold, or I don't know what it is. But I knew I hit the target because people were gently sobbing. And I continued to minister because this is a common experience in this fallen world. People tell us we're stupid. Our parents, our teachers say we're dumb, we'll never amount to nothing. You're not too bright, we're made fun of. So what that does is it programs you to think and believe you're stupid, which which causes there to be a ceiling on the level of your development. So by speaking the truth to these students and to God's people under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, they were being set free from the bondage of a lie where they falsely believed that they were dumb or stupid. And I just wanted to speak in the authority of Jesus Christ that that was a lie and it wasn't true. And then I got back to to, to, to the subject. God doesn't create his people to be stupid. But the devil goes over time. The devil uses demonic power sorcery, the occult, the educational system, which is really an indoctrination, propaganda, scientific mind control system. The devil uses all of those things to program you into believing you're stupid and dumb, or to, to, or to scientifically dumb you down so that he can enslave you. Visit paulmcguire.us and really I'm saying this because I love you. I don't get anything out of that. I mean, what I got out of it is I had to spend a lot of the ministry's money to acquire all these uh, backup sites so we could stay connected, so you would have a lifeline wherever you are on planet Earth. There are, the Lord brought this to my mind the other day, and he's confirming it on a regular basis. There is a large number of people who are listening to this program in cars, in faraway nations, on ships, all over the place, truck drivers. And through modern technology, they're listening. And there is a considerable percentage of people listening to this program, Paul McGuire Report, and our video productions, the prophetic emergency alerts, and reading our books. And you are serving in the armed services. You could be in any number of branches of the armed services. And you're listening to me now. Maybe everybody's asleep. And maybe you're in some room where there's a whole lot of soldiers or whatever. You've got the pillow and blankets pulled over you. Quietly listening to this as you fall asleep. I want you to know something. The Lord put it on my heart, supernaturally, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to tell you that He knows you're listening to this program. 
And even as I'm talking to you now, I can feel the confirmation of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit is anointing what I'm saying, and it's going right into your heart. I want you to know, my brother, my dear brother and sister in Jesus Christ, that no matter where you are on planet Earth, no matter what kind of position, military or otherwise, you're holding. No matter what private corporation, government agency you work for, anywhere on planet Earth, just like this signal is able to reach you, the Lord knows where you are. The Lord knows where you are, and he's ministering to you right now with his spirit. And you know this, that part of the reason you listen to the Paul McGuire report (coughs) is to gain knowledge, historical understanding, wisdom. But part of the reason you listen is that your spiritual man or woman is highly sensitive, and you are you have a need, and you're drinking in the Spirit of God as if you would drink in <clears throat> the rivers of living water, and you're being nourished and fed and strengthened, and the presence of the Lord is coming all over you, no matter where you are on planet Earth, even if where you are is in a classified location. <clears throat> The Lord is ministering to you. His presence is coming upon you. And because the Lord loves you, and the Lord loves everyone you're serving with, including your, your, the officers above you, commanding officers, that you right now, and all the, the soldiers or officers with you, you are right now, Dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Protected. God has your back. You're dwelling in the shadow of the Almighty. The blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Your, your, un, your sins and things you've done wrong are under the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And Jesus views you as sinless. You're protected. He's watching your back. Except when God watches your back, he's got his angelic, his highest ranking angelic force. If you could see into the spiritual realm right now, the the room, the tent, the facility, the the place where you are is jam-packed with God's most powerful warring angels or guardian angels. They're all around you. And if he touches your eyes, you can see that they're all around you and they're all around your fellow uh, soldiers and officers and people that you work with. And they're all around you and watching over you and protecting you internally where you are. And then externally, outside of the physical place where you are, there are thousands of heavily spiritually armed angelic armies. They're there to protect you and all those that are with you and those that you serve, whether or not you deserve it or not, because of grace. That's an awesome promise, man. That is heavy. I pray that prayer for you and others almost every night. I pray for myself also. The interior of my dwelling is crowded with, with God's equivalent of the highest ranking angels, with God's equivalent of special ops forces from heaven. I mean, if you're going to ask God for supernatural protection, which you should, because if you don't, they're not going to be there. If you ask not, you have not. And if you're going to ask, be bold. Be bold to ask for the best. Do you think I ask God for supernatural protection from a bunch of newly enlisted (laughs) uh, 
uh, warrior angels that, that don't know how to use their spiritual uh, weaponry? No, I ask for God's special forces. So should you. Because when God's special force, forces, those angels are guarding the exterior, interior. Believe me, he's got your back. And talk about night vision. You may not be able to afford maybe your, your uh, whatever unit or whatever you want to call it that you serve in. Maybe they don't have a lot or maybe they don't have any of the, the, the new night vision technology. Well, let me tell you something. God's special forces angels, they have night vision technology already built in to, to the eyes, to their eyes. They can see everything from a long distance. And not only that, they're in constant communication with God, and God sees everything. The Bible says nothing is hidden from the eyes of the Lord. So you're protected. There could be some plot, some conspiracy, some <clears throat> uh, dangerous thing coming your way. Can I give you a word of advice? Don't wait until after the tragedy to pray. Be proactive. Call on God now. Let's look at what Daniel did. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. I'm not here to play games, as maybe you've guessed. I'm not here to play games. And I'm not here to lose. So now that we've established that fact, that I'm not here to play games, and I'm not here to lose, that means I'm here for intentionality, purpose, and God's destiny. And I'm here to function as more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus and an overcomer in Christ Jesus. So we're in agreement on that, right? Because you're not here to lose either. You want to you help people? You want to love your neighbor as yourself? <clears throat> Spread the links of our programming, our videos, our articles, our audio our radio, our television, our messages, spread them far and wide. Do an end run around the big, bad, big brother censorship machine and spread the truth because the truth sets people free. Wherever you are on planet Earth, it's not an accident that you're listening to this program. God arranged it. I want to read you something. From the book of Daniel. Daniel was a prophet of God. He was a real prophet of God. It's important for you to understand this. In the military world, and I never served in the military, by the way, but I have great respect for the military. And I've done a lot of my own self education in military history and in things like military and scientific technologies and things like psyops or psychological operations. And I've self-educated myself. When I say self-educated myself, I read hundreds of books a year, okay? And I speed read a lot of them, but it doesn't mean I don't retain them. And uh, the, the military, the U.S. military, which is this is not like rah-rah America working away flags in front of your face, but it is a healthy respect for the uniqueness and exceptionalism of America, which has the most unique constitution and bill of rights on planet Earth. So Paul McGuire has a, I don't worship America, but I have a reverential respect and admiration for America and the people who defend America civilian and and non-civilian. Okay, so Daniel is is in in the center of the cyclone here. He's a prophet of God. He's a prophet of God because when he prophesies, he gets it right. If you're listening to prophets and they got it wrong, you have a big problem. 
It's like relying on military intelligence that has been compromised. Why would you rely on military intelligence, which could mean life or death for you and your uh, fellow soldiers? Why would you why would you uh, rely on corrupted military intelligence? Well, why would you rely on somebody who calls themselves a prophet, but they got it 180 degrees wrong, and there's a whole bunch of them. There's hundreds of them. They got it all wrong regarding the election, what was going to happen up to the election, and what's happening now. They got it wrong. This is why I don't call myself a prophet, <clears throat> because the, the biblical Old Testament biblical definition of a prophet is you have to be 100% accurate. If you get it wrong just once, you're disqualified by God from being a true prophet of God. And in the Old Testament, you were stoned to death. Now, it's good that a, a very tiny percentage of people publicly repented for, for issuing false prophecies. But we have a whole bunch of false prophets out there. And I'm not one to glibly or easily point the finger and call people false prophets. <clears throat> but when you have led God's people astray <clears throat> by telling them the opposite of what's happening, you have endangered their lives. You've given them a false sense of security, so they're being led like lambs to the slaughter. And and they don't have the facts and intelligence to make the right decisions because through, through your pride, through, through your lack of development of your gifts or whatever, you issued to them false prophecies. We have a whole lot of people in the body of Christ who are completely wrong about the election. Why are the, 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 the more criminal thing is why are you listening to them when they have a track record of being inaccurate? Okay, <clears throat> so in uh, <clears throat> Daniel chapter 10, uh, it says, Daniel chapter 10, verse 10, Suddenly a hand touched me, Daniel, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. See, when you have a supernatural encounter that's authentic and biblical with a true man of God, a true minister of God, or a true prophet of God, the holiness that is operating in that minister or prophet's life based entirely on grace or unmerited favor, it, it causes you to tremble in that person's presence because you can sense the genuine, authentic power of God operating in them. Okay, now, uh, then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel. So, God is always telling his servants, even a high-level prophet like Daniel, do not fear. And God is saying the same thing to you and me right now, wherever you are on planet Earth. Whatever situation you're facing, do not fear. Not a request. It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment to you from God. Do not fear. So you obey the Lord. Do not fear. For from the first, and then he gives them the reason why you shouldn't fear. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand, you see, Daniel, when he was praying, was setting his heart to understand. He wanted to understand for the sake of God's people. He wanted to gain knowledge which gives power for the sake of God's people. From the day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. So what this angel, uh, Gabriel, is telling 
uh, Daniel, was from the very first moment you began to humble yourself before God and cry out to God. From that very first moment, God heard your prayers. And because God heard your prayers, that's why Gabriel the angel has now arrived to talk personally with Daniel. Um, He says, I have come because of your words. That's why our prayers are important. But the prince and Gabriel goes along, making an explanation. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, or Iran, withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you to understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. When he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And suddenly one, having the likeness of the sons of men, touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. Okay, so what's happening here? The prince, there were, this is, God is revealing to us that this is a multidimensional spiritual warfare that's going on. And Daniel is battling various rankings of, of a hierarchy of angels. And God is sending him, uh, God, uh, Daniel's battling a hierarchy of fallen angels, and, and God is telling him and sending him uh, high-ranking angels from God, as well as lower-ranking angels from God. So the prince of the kingdom of Persia, or Iran, is the prince of Persia. He's a territorial spirit, one of the highest-ranking demons or fallen angels serving directly under Lucifer, okay? He's heavy duty, heavy, heavy duty. And, um, but he's, he tells Daniel that he was blocked in the invisible realm. So there was a roadblock in the invisible realm. He could not physically or spiritually get to Daniel. And sometimes that happens in our life. We're crying out to God, and, and, and God's answer is blocked. The release of his angels are, are blocked. So wh- what caused it to turn around? Okay. Well, what caused it to turn around is uh, Gabriel ex- explains it to him. Um, what happened was this. Verse 19, and he said to me, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. Okay, right now, we we need to acknowledge something. The Holy Spirit is anointing his word, and God is speaking to you and me, and God is saying to you and me right now these words. He's saying, Beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So wherever you are, God Almighty is saying to you, don't fear. Be strong. Be strong. Be strong. Peace be to you. Now, you and I have to receive that by faith, and by faith, we activate the mind of Christ, and that's what that's how our minds and spirits will operate if we obey God. So what happened next was verse 20. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the Prince of Persia, or the Prince of Iran, high ranking territorial spirit of Satan. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece, 
or the Prince of Europe or Europa will come. These are the highest level territorial spirits. So whatever Daniel was called to do, he was special ops of the highest ranking order because these are the most powerful demonic powers under Satan operating on planet Earth. But I tell you the truth, what is noted in the scripture of truth, no one upholds me against these territorial spirits except except Michael, your prince. Michael is the highest ranking angel under God. He's in charge of protecting Israel as well as other assignments. Now, let's read what else it says. Uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 2. And now I tell you the truth, the whole three more campaigns. So this is prophecy of the future, a prophecy of prophetically of kings that will arise in Persia or Iran, and things that are going to happen politically uh, in Greece. And then verse 3, Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. This is a prophetic statement to, to Daniel about the coming of the Antichrist. Okay? Now, what else happens? So, so the point is, is that because Daniel was truly repenting before God, truly humbling himself before God, that was the turning point. That was the moment where the, the tide of the spiritual battle turned around and Gabriel and Michael were, were released to defeat um, the prince of Persia, or the prince of Iran, and the prince of Greece, or the prince of Europe. That the tide of the spiritual battle and the physical battle turned because Daniel was on his knees engaging in high-level spiritual warfare that involved high-level, no phony baloney repentance. Okay? So we have to understand that's what that's what changes history. See, when we ask the question, um, Lord, what happens next? Lord, what happens to America next? What happens to Europe next? Although that's an important question to ask, it's not entirely framed from a biblical worldview. This is why you and I are joint heirs with Jesus. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We are overcomers in Christ Jesus. We're not supposed to pray to God as if we had a victim or slave identity. We're not supposed to pray to God as if we were going into captivity or slavery. That is not the core of our identity, and we shouldn't be praying that way. So if we're praying, Something like this, Lord, show me what's going to happen next in America or Europe or whatever nation you're going to live in. If that's your prayer and you're thinking of Washington, D.C. or Britain or whatever, and you're saying, Lord, what happens next? That is a partially correct prayer, but it doesn't fully hit the target. Why? Because God said you're not a victim. You're not supposed to be asking God Almighty what happens next, as if you had nothing to do with it. For crying out loud, the entire message of the Word of God, beginning in Genesis, where, where God made Adam and Eve to rule and reign over planet Earth. That means to be the king and queen over planet Earth, and they were given dominion or rulership over planet Earth. They didn't ask what happens next because they had the authority to rule and reign planet Earth like kings and queens. They determine in their authority what happens next. In the same way, a true Christian and a true Christian church in America, it's not sufficient to simply ask the Lord what happens next. It's an important question. 
it can provide context and education. But it, 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 there's a flaw in the question. The flaw is we don't say to the Lord what happens next as if we had nothing to do with it. Listen, my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we have everything to do with the answer to the question, what happens next. Why? Because Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, has imparted into us his supernatural authority to rule and reign, to occupy the land until he comes, to exercise dominion. As such, what happens next in the future should never be perceived as some fatalistic, well, I have no power over the situation. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. Fooey. Fooey. You. God has given you the power. Your church the power. Other believers the power. Every true Christian listening to me across planet Earth right now, asking God what happens next is important, but it's not, it's not full tilt boogie. You've got to go the whole way and recognize that it's up to you operating in kingdom authority. You and your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ all over planet Earth, you determine what happens next. It's not fatalism. It's not luck. It's not fate. You determine what happens next by whether or not you're willing to obey God and operate in accordance with his kingdom principles, such as acquiring knowledge, which gives you power, such as being proactive, such as occupying the land until he comes. If you're operating in this level where you're occupying the land until he comes, you don't have to be frightened to the answer to the question, what happens next? Because if you're doing your job, when I never heard this preached in my church, that's because you've been going to the wrong church and a curse is on you. You say, that's, that's very rude. I don't care whether it's rude or not. If you're going to a church where the Word of God is being censored, specifically the book of Revelation. 87% of evangelical churches refuse to teach the book of Revelation, even though in the opening chapters it says that there's a curse that's released upon you if you change or don't teach or censor the book of Revelation. Or there's a blessing on you if you do teach correctly and read the book of Revelation. The same thing with the last chapter in the book of Revelation. You release a supernatural blessing if you correctly interpret and teach and study the book of Revelation. But if you reject the book of Revelation, or if you distort it or change it, God's word says you're under a curse, and in fact it gets worse than that. God tells you that if you change or alter or modify the book of Revelation, He's going to blot your name out of the book of life. That's heavy stuff. That's very heavy stuff. So we see that Daniel turns the tide of the spiritual battle because he seeks the face of God in true repentance. And he intercedes. He stands in the gap for his people. Okay? God wants you and I to do that. Now, what else is there in the book of Daniel that we need to know? There's a lot written in the book of Daniel that we need to know. First of all, uh, the book of Daniel is filled with end times prophecy of what's going to happen. You want to know what's going to happen next? Read the book of Daniel. It explains end time prophecy in the last days. Now, what else do we read in the book of Daniel? Well, we read uh, in the book of Daniel, because Daniel interprets the dreams and visions of King Nebuchadnezzar. 
um, which explains what's going to happen and the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, notice that <clears throat> I'm going to read to you the commentary that, that I wrote uh, in this book. Uh, the King James, the New King James Bible for students. I had the privilege of, of writing a great deal of the study notes, Greek, Hebrew, and uh, Hebrew word definitions. So I'm reading from uh, what's actually in this Bible here. I had the privilege to write it. And it's called A Night Vision. The king's court, <clears throat> what king? Oh, it's the king of, uh, of uh, Babylon. Now, let's read what it says. The king's court was filled with magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers, whose job it was to advise the king. And his friends did not go around protesting all this occult activity. Did you hear that? Daniel, the, the dynamic of the world that Daniel was being raised up into, is Daniel was being prepared, along with his associates, to be a supernatural consultant, prophet, and advisor to, to King Nebuchadnezzar. In the process of his preparation, he had to study and learn a great deal about the occult, the demonic, and supernatural powers by which these occult advisors advised King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what I'm going to say, you need to be very careful with. Very, very few people are called by God to penetrate the enemy's camps at the highest level. The overwhelming majority of Christians, if they were, they were to be uh, interfacing with these sorcerers and wizards and magicians, etc., most likely they would become demon-possessed or backslide, because they're not, they, they were never prepared or called to do it. In my research, and I'm not claiming to be Don Daniel, in my research, I have had to spend years not only studying the Bible, but I had I was involved in the New Age and the occult personally for over a decade, and I have studied hundreds of New Age occultic books that um, I'm able to read and not get taken down by because God has called me. God has covered me, God has anointed me to do that. And I say that with humility, because the minute I stop relying on the power of God, I, I could be taken down. So this is not pride coming before a fall. If you think you can just dive in there, uh, you're mistaken. So what did, what did I write here? about King Nebuchadnezzar's court. The king's court was filled with magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers, whose job it was to advise the king. Daniel and his friends did not go around protesting all this occult activity. They understood that God and his spirit uh, had actually placed them in their position of power and they waited on God for direction. One day the king had a dream, which he commanded his occult advisors to interpret. None of the astrologers, magicians, or sorcerers could interpret the king's dreams. However, God supernaturally revealed the meaning of the king's dream to Daniel in a night vision after he went to God in prayer, searching for an answer. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed that Daniel could interpret the dream when all his occult advisors could not, that he said, quote, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Daniel was able to give glory to God, not by running around and pro protesting the false god, 
but by waiting on God in prayer and allowing him to give him supernatural insight into the king's dream. Okay, so this is this is important. There are a very few that God calls to do this. Uh, and and so what we have to understand that it was very, very common in in what I call these occult super civilizations that have risen up throughout history, in which you have political power, such as the king, etc., the military, but also the king and the military are relying on regular supernatural demonic guidance, and they have a large pool, sometimes 300 men and women, who are professional occult advisors, uh, and, and they function as sorcerers, magicians, astrologers, clairvoyants, psychics, uh, and, and other such things. Now, don't make the mistake in thinking that this is just a, a clown show, because if they come to the king of Babylon and they fail to interpret his vision or dream with 100% accuracy, then they're killed. So there's an accountability structure there. You can't be a clown and, and, and pretend to be an occult advisor of the king. Because if you strike out, if you give the king a, a wrong answer or a wrong prophecy, all of these kings would kill you in a second. So, so there has to be a sobriety here. Now, remember, King Nebuchadnezzar issued a threat to his 300 occult advisors. He said to them, if you don't interpret my vision or my dream accurately, I'm going to have you all killed. And he meant it. Um, so, he, he gave that warning to, to his occult advisors. By the way, one of the groups of the occult advisors, they were called the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans came from a, a occult civilization that was the, the mother of, of witchcraft uh, and the occult. And if we go back in ancient history, uh, we see that, that uh, Abraham uh, came from the culture of the Chaldeans, which were heavily involved in the occult. Now, uh, this is what the king says in verse 2. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. No, the king meant business. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, he meant it literally, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. So in other words, King Nebuchadnezzar was threatening his occult advisors that he would slice and dice them, he would slaughter them if they gave a wrong interpretation. And then he said he would burn their houses, their wives, and their children to the ground like an ash sheep. So this was not an idle threat. Very, very serious threat. Very serious threat. And so we need to learn from that. Okay. So what happens is they couldn't, they couldn't answer. They could not interpret the dream of the king. And so Daniel was called. And when Daniel came, 
God revealed Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the last days and all that it implied. He supernaturally revealed it to Daniel. And this made the 300 occult advisors ashamed because they thought they were going to get killed. Daniel then interpreted the dream, and we don't have time to go into it, but the dream is a prophetic outline of history and the rise and fall of the major prophetic kingdoms culminating in the rise of the revived Roman Empire or the fourth kingdom at the end of the age. So Daniel was promoted. Now, this same uh, uh, dynamic happens numerous times in the Bible. Joseph was raised up out of slavery. He had to interpret a dream, an economic forecasting dream, of Pharaoh, the Pharaoh God King, the mightiest ruler of the mightiest empire uh, on planet Earth at the time. And he had 300 occult advisors, and he issued the same threat. But um, Joseph supernaturally interpreted the dream and what it meant, and it was accurate, and he was promoted to be second in command. He was like Pharaoh, God King number two. He had a signet ring, and he was given the authority of the Pharaoh to rule and reign over Egypt because he was accurate in his interpretation. So this is the critical thing here. We live in a time, and I talk about, I go into what I'm about to mention to you in my books, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, uh, Conquering the Matrix, uh, A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 2. You can get all of these and, and the other books that deal with answers to this stuff. Special discount price book bundles, you can get them at paulmcguire.us. We live in a time where the big tech giants are regularly, and, and people high up in the tech industry, are regularly consulting mystics, uh, uh, clairvoyants, gurus, uh, spiritual teachers, uh, clairvoyants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're also microdosing psychedelic drugs that put them in an altered state of consciousness because they want to receive supernatural answers to their uh, business uh, challenges and to their technological challenges. This is widespread in our culture, in the elite circles. Rothschild, heavily involved in the occult. I explain all this in my books. Get a book bundle discount. And then let's just take the military for a moment. I get into detail uh, about this in my book with the book Conquering the Matrix and the Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind the History of the World. The military um, has now immersed itself in the creation of super soldiers, the utilization of occult Eastern mystical power, meditation, altered states of consciousness, the use of certain psychedelic drugs or performance-enhancing drugs. Uh, the military is involved in psyops, which also includes uh, remote viewing, which is a form of uh, weaponized mental telepathy and uh, weaponized ESP. The military and military sciences, such as practiced by Stanford Research Institute, MIT, and other schools, they are involved in clairvoyance, in uh, the expansion of human consciousness, the communication with spirit guides, and also all sorts of high level uh, occultic and scientific processes because they've arrived at the same place as the ancient super civilizations, and that is they have come to the place where they have merged science and technology with the occult, with uh, the psychics, with um, 
uh, all kinds of new age activities. We now have entirely new realms of military science that have to do with and utilize black physics, uh, quantum tunneling, quantum physics, bending time and space, um, the, uh, the training people to remote view, which means you can read their minds or location from an incredible distance, but you can also project sickness, disease, and death uh, because these mind technologies have been weaponized and people can die, have their hearts stopped by simply somebody meditating and focusing their mind and using various forms of uh, energetics or bioenergetics for either healing or destruction. This is the world that we're now in, in in the modern U.S. military and militaries around the world. The name of the game is full-spectrum dominance. You dominate, which means rulership, by the way. Dominate comes from dominion, as in the book of Genesis. So the modern military, in their creation of super soldiers and uh, training their soldiers to get involved in these esoteric practices, they can utilize all kinds of weaponry, intelligence gathering, enhanced uh, uh, performance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, you take like Robert Monroe and uh, binaural beats and isochronic tones and using EMF frequencies to travel into different dimensions. That's a reality. Black physics is a reality. John C. Lilly and uh, sensory deprivation, psychedelic dread, drugs leaving his body. That is a reality. Uh, amplifying your intelligence through all kinds of means. Uh, things beyond meditation, astral projection, uh, contacting and communicating with entities from the fourth or other dimensions. This, and I just talked about a fraction of the thing. I get into detail about all these things in my books, like The Greatest Battle, like Conquering the Matrix, like Volume 2 of um, uh, The Prophecy of the Future of America. As a Christian, you need to be ahead of the game. You need to be like Daniel or Joseph. You're not supposed to be a stumbling, bumbling hillbilly who can't even mouth the vocabulary of full-spectrum dominance. You need to have cutting-edge understanding of the unlimited potential that God has given you in the Bible, and I'm talking about supernaturally. And you must have a robust understanding, a transcendent understanding of the operating principles of psychic power uh, and other such things. Not because you're getting, you're opening the door for the demonic, not because you're backsliding, because if you want to be used by God in today's technological world, where super science, super technology is the order of the day, you got to know your stuff. You got to be able to deliver the goods. And that's the bottom line. They will listen to you. Doors will open for you, but you have to outperform in full spectrum dominance. You have to outperform as Daniel did, as Joseph did, all of their heavy duty occult scientists, physics, engineers, and advisors. And if you can't outperform, and if you can't deliver the goods, you're going to get a door slammed on your face, and they're not going to want to hear from you. So that's how we win the spiritual battle. We outperform. We have the confidence to know that Christianity is truth and not a religion. God bless you, your brother in Christ. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Let's not play games. The world has seen the game of evangelical Christianity. They're not impressed. They want to see full-spectrum dominance in the business world and in the, the domain of the military. 
I'm Paul McGuire. Yeah.